Matt, please start with your second talk on chiral distances. Chiral distances. Okay. Hang on. So, we have known about the notion of handedness in molecular structures for quite a while. Uh, the first reference I've ever found in English, direct reference, is from uh, Lord Kelvin, uh, who loosely defines a molecule as chiral if, as he says, its mirror image ideally realized cannot be brought to coincide with itself. He even uh, uses the term enantiomer, which he says he's taken from the German to describe the two mirror image forms. And this sort of discrete chirality, left and right handedness, turns out to be important. I'm sure we all know the, the tragic story of, of thalidomide and its left and right handed forms and, uh, and, and its effects. Uh, but we're also beginning now to make materials where, where asymmetry at the micro or macro scale actually drives a property of interest. Uh, we might want to be tuning the, the asymmetry of a structure, make it more or less asymmetric in some way. So to make that more mathematically meaningful, we need to get a little bit more formal. So by ideally realized, we mean as some sort of discrete point cloud in a vector space with a basis. And by bought to coincide with itself, we mean trying to map one such cloud to another without deforming it. That is keeping all the distances and the angles the same, the isometries I was talking about in the earlier talk. And by mirror image, we mean that a map is a reflection. Uh, we, which we can kind of define in linear algebra, but broadly means we can't move, say, the point cloud representing this triangle around rigidly within the space and map it on top of its mirror image. We're going to have to deform it to do that. And on that continuous path of deformation of the triangle, it will pass through some non-chiral structure, some structure with mirror symmetry. And when we're talking about the general approach to quantifying chirality, what we mean is we want to put some consistent number on how much deformation that is. How much, how much do I have to say deform this triangle to go to get it to something uh, with with mirror symmetry? How much do I? How what's the minimum amount I have to deform this triangle to get it to another triangle? And ideally, we want that to be zero if something is sitting, uh, if for triangles which are uh, have mirror which are mirror images of themselves which have a mirror symmetry already and we want it to be sort of larger for in some sense more asymmetric structures now this gets slightly harder for lattices uh, or for periodic structures uh, because because periodicity comes into play uh, so we want to examine kind of again very simple structures because we're mathematicians we've been trying to approach the problem again from the ground up uh, so we've been using beasts as simple as this, a lattice, which is the set of all integer combinations uh, of some, uh, some pair of vectors in R2. And as before, uh, we know what kind of discrete point symmetries a lattice can have, either through inversion uh, or through uh, rectangular, um, hexagonal or square symmetry. And we can split that out further. But really, if we're just looking at how symmetric something is, maybe we just want to look at the automorphism group, the point groups. Um, so how can a 2D lattice be, be chiral and how do you measure it? Now, to explain this, I am going to have to take a quick jog through one of my earlier talks. Uh, or, um, and I'm hoping that people, and because that's going to be very quick, I'm hoping people don't mind me trusting me a bit when I make some assertions. If you don't, the maths and the explanations are all in... Uh, are all in the papers we, uh, we refer to here. So it turns out that among the many lattice reductions that give us a unique basis uh, to, to generate a lattice from, the one derived by Zelling, where the two basis vectors and their negative sum uh, all have obtuse angles between them in two dimensions, is very usefully unique up to isometry, although not rigid motion. Because, uh, because if you have a, uh, an ortho pair of orthogonal vectors in the superbase, then you, have, uh, you can have two classes of, of, of superbase related, um, related by a reflection. And as a result, if you take the inner products of this obtuse superbase, you get the root invariant, which is an isometry invariant of the lattice. Uh, so it's something that doesn't change when you move the lattice, uh, when you rotate the lattice or translate it or indeed reflect it. And what's important about this is it's a complete invariant. Every lattice has just one associated ordered triple of positive numbers and every ordered triple of, non of positive, well, non-negative numbers, since R12 can be zero, um, is, uh, represents a lattice. And this means that for free, you get a space 
so you turn a you turn a lattice into a point in an actual space, and even better for our purposes, all the lattices with these higher kinds of symmetry live in nicely well defined subspaces, which are boundaries of the cone or intersections of those boundaries. And if you're not bothered about scaling, if you're just tracking the geometry, you can take a slice through the space and map it to a simplex in R2, as we've done here, uh, with this, this particular um, manipulation of the, of the parameters in the root invariant. Um, and again, the boundaries of the space are either empty in the case of this, uh, this lower right-hand vertex, which is where, in theory, lattices become very infinitely long and thin. Uh, and it's sort of geometrically impossible, uh, or uh, or they contain uh, lattices with higher symmetry, all of which have a mirror symmetry in two dimension. So every single one of these uh, these molecules, uh, any every single one of these lattices is not chiral. So to finally get to chirality, there is a way to distinguish, thanks to the root invariant, between mirror images of lattices by using what we call the sign. If we order the shortest two vectors in the obtuse superbase, uh, make their columns into a matrix and take the determinant, that's an invariant of a lattice under rigid motion. Uh, so, uh, so by rigid motion, we mean rotation and translation only, uh, no reflection. So you can then distinguish between two, um, uh, two mirror images of a lattice. And we can therefore turn our isometry invariant into a rigid motion invariant by appending the sign of the, uh, of, of the lattice. And if we want then to, to visualize that as a map, we can, uh, we can add a second version of the space. We can add a second copy of the space to, uh, and, and kind of glue it along a subspace, one of these boundary subspaces where the lattices have, have zero chirality, as we've done here, creating a doubled cone simply by switching the last two uh, values of the uh, of the root invariant uh, in for for negative for negative signed lattices in the three-dimensional case, and gluing along the diagonal uh, with this this formal map. Um, here in the uh, in the two dimensional case where we don't uh, where we've we've abstracted away the scale of the lattice as a parameter um, in essence and again you can see uh, you can you can see what this actually means in terms of a lattice as you move about in the space again we smoothly deform a lattice from its uh, from one to its mirror image passing across uh, this diagonal boundary. And as we move along this line, you can imagine the lattice uh, smoothly deforming. Its sign becomes zero here and then discontinuously becomes negative here. Uh, but the actual parameters, the actual, the actual invariant changes smoothly. Um, so we're talking about if we want to know in general, uh, if, if, uh, if we want to, to know in general sort of how you how much deformation then you have to uh, to make to turn one lattice into another, uh, we we are talking about the one which requires the least overall change in position. And what that means is, if I if I've got a, if I've got two lattices with opposite sign, well, if I've got two lattices with the same sign, I can just measure the straight line distance inside this space. If I've got two lattices with opposite sign, I've got to determine how. Uh, what the kind of shortest, the smallest deformation is that passes through a, uh, a higher symmetry lattice, so, so that passes through a lattice with mirror symmetry. So I've kind of got to minimize these distances um, across all boundaries in both case. But you can prove that gives you a metric and it has all the properties you want, the mathematical properties of a metric. It works exactly like a distance in two dimensional space. Again, we're talking just here about the, uh, the straight line uh, distance in two and three dimensional space, the Minkowski metric uh, of order two, but any metric really that works in a space like this will give you the same, will give you the same results. It's just, this is, uh, this is one of the ones that's particularly easily and directly computable. Now, uh, if we've got anything as a metric and we just care, if all we care about is how much deformation will it take to make something symmetrical, so how far away from symmetry uh, is a lattice, 
I can define just the distance to these boundary spaces, the nearest point in any boundary space. And in fact, I can go further than that. So I can just minimize the distance to the boundary if I want to know how asymmetric in general, but I can also ask how close to hexagonal, how close to square is my lattice or how close uh, in general to having D2 symmetry. Um, and I can just do that by measuring the distance uh, to the relevant subspace. So I've got a definition, uh, I've got an entire family of chiral distances. And again, um, the chiral distances can, uh, I can, I can really use any metric I like in this space, but straight line distance is the most intuitive. Um, so, uh, so that's what I'm doing. Um, uh, but that gives me, so, so I, I, you know, any family I like, but I've got a family of distances that are actual proper measurements that do everything you need them to do of how symmetric a lattice is or how close a lattice is to a particular point group symmetry. So to show you how easy this is, again, to, to compute, we've taken the Cambridge Crystallographic Structural Database, which in, a, in an updated slide I'll give a reference for, uh, we've taken these million, well, 860,000, over three quarters of a million structures. We've generated three dimensional lattices from them and we've asked what do their, uh, what does their uh, chiral distance, what do their chiral distances look like? Um, again, you've seen the map here, so I, I, I won't dwell on that, uh, but, uh, but you can see how, how that works. Um, and again, the preponderance of, of negative, positive versus negatively signed lattices is to some extent an artifact. It's to do with the fact that we're picking the, uh, picking the lattice bases in length order. However, we can plot out these chiral distances in, uh, uh, from, again, we're plotting the, either the distance from every boundary, and this is for the two-dimensional case, uh, where there's a, a kind of a, there's kind of limits on the value, so it's a bit, it's a bit easier to plot. Uh, this is for the, the square case and the hexagonal case. And you can see that, uh, that that kind of suggested increase in density, that preference for higher symmetry is very much shown here. What we've done is we've taken out the, um, uh, the, the lattices which have exactly, uh, which are achiral, which have mirror symmetry, because otherwise they would dominate this. You wouldn't really, you wouldn't really see anything in this plot. Uh, but you can see there is a preference for higher, for higher symmetry lattices in general. Uh, but for squareness, you can see the distribution is rather different. There's kind of a maximum uh, and, a, and a, a bit of a gap at um, uh, certainly um, near, near mm. to, to zero chirality, less of one in, uh, for, for hexagonal lattices. Um, we think part of that is due to uh, is due to rounding. Uh, in in essence, uh, if something is a lot of lattice assignment or Bravé assignment uh, algorithms, we'll see that something is some is close to ninety and correct to ninety. So what we're seeing here, because because our measure is continuous, we're actually seeing the gap resulting in that correction, uh, where there is, where there is perhaps less of that for uh, for spotting hexagonal lattices, which are kind of arising from or hexagonal two-dimensional lattices. Uh, but you can see these maxima here at uh, here at roughly plus or minus one over root two and here at plus or minus uh, 0.5. Really that's, that's coming from the geometry of the space we're working with. So if you think about what these actually are, uh, they're what, what any given bar of these histograms are, it's all the lattices at a consistent bin of, dis of uh, radial distances from either the, um, the origin or the point zero, 0,1, representing square and hexagonal lattices, uh, respectively. And if you look at how that works, you can see that the kind of maximal intersection uh, happens at, at these values. So, so you just get a much higher, so, so that's why you're seeing many more lattices in that region. So it's kind of, it kind of naturally comes out of the geometry of the space. Um, Perhaps more practically, we can see if um, any physical properties, any chemical properties of lattices have a um, have an impact on on chiral distance. Uh, so one of the natural things to do is say take um, lattices uh, with high and low molecular weight structures, either fifty thousand highest and lowest molecular weight um, <laughs> molecules. And we can see here, and I'm just showing you here. This is the uh, this is the distances in three dimensions. So in the in the cone, and the, and here in the triangle, we've again 
excluded high symmetry lattices uh, from this. We've, we've excluded, so this is, these are all triclinic lattices, as it were. Um, and, and an interesting uh, notion that you can see here is that uh, high weight lattices seem to occupy a wider range of, uh, of chiral distances uh, than, um, than low weight lattices, possibly because uh, the, the kind of bulk of a high weight lattice means that it's forced to adopt a highly asymmetric configuration, whereas a small lattice can kind of pack itself more efficiently. Possibly, but either way, this just just shows that you can see with a continuous measure, um, a you 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 can see with a continuous measure a a um, you know some some differences, small differences, but differences nonetheless uh, in in symmetry in continuous symmetry based on uh, uh, based um, on molecular weight. Perhaps slightly more usefully, we actually are interested in the two-dimensional geometry of molecules in the sense that we're now producing increasingly monolayer materials in two dimensions. And some of these monolayer materials um, have properties that are dependent on them having an asymmetric lattice geometry. Uh, there's, a, there's a nice uh, survey of that uh, in, this, uh, in this paper here. Um, so we might want to take databases of two-dimensional materials and look at their asymmetry. And a couple of big popular ones, we've got uh, 2D Map Mappedia. Um, it's quite a large, it's got, well, last time I downloaded it, it's got six and a few thousand structures. Um, and it's quite interesting in the sense that uh, there's a few kind of real, definitely from the literature two-dimensional materials. Uh, there's about, then about half of them have been simulated in the sense that they've been found as potential layer structures when they're bulk 3D material. And we've got um, uh, which, uh, some which have been simulated by taking those layers and replacing them with kind of making uh, suitable atom substitutions. And the first thing we might want to do is plot these in our space. Uh, and we can see here, and this is a, a common thing with two dimensional materials, that they're very dense along the boundaries. So lots of these things do prefer to be, uh, to, to, to occupy um, higher symmetry configurations. But for the ones that don't, you can't see any particular pattern. They once again occupy uh, the interior of our, of our mapped space of two dimensional lattices um, in all sorts of positions. And there isn't that kind of artificial that we saw preference for, for handedness either, left or right handedness. So there's there's quite a, a range of configurations of, of two dimensional materials. And we want to show how we can kind of usefully use this to maybe find a highly asymmetric um, uh, 2D materials. So here we've taken a couple of um, a couple of uh, um, quantities from the database that indicate how easy it might be to actually make these two dimensional materials. So the exfoliation energy, uh, which ideally we want to be reasonably low, uh, uh, which is kind of how much energy it would take to peel a layer off, and the decomposition energy, which ideally we want to be slightly higher because that's um, how much energy it takes to pull the whole thing apart. Uh, so we want to kind of try and find that. And what we've done here is overlaid uh, the signed chirality. So we've used the signed chirality here, essentially. We've multiplied the chiral distance by the sign. Um, and uh, then we've kind of filtered out here on the right everything except um, structures which have um, a relatively high chiral distance. And pleasingly uh, among them is something that we already know about. So this is a nice kind of confirmation, proof of concept. Um, Antimony telluride is known to be an, a, a semiconducting monolayer with an asymmetric uh, layer geometry. And there it is um, uh, pulled out of the materials project. Uh, and we found it as being uh, strongly, strongly uh, asymmetric. But we can also find new things. So this is, uh, this is um, we've got a, a silicon, and chlorine structure here, uh, which is known as a precursor. It's a chemical precursor to silicon nitrogen monolayers, uh, but on its own appears to form, possibly be able to form stable monolayers. Um, and we can sort of see here, I've kind of picked an angle for the structure on the materials project uh, that show uh, how that might possibly work. And even more enigmatically, we've got something down here. Now, this rather odd construction with bismuth and boron and oxygen is not known. There are no publications, it's not experimentally observed, but it has been simulated as a possibly, possibly stable material in the materials project database. And again, you can see where an asymmetric layer might be pulled off. So again, this shows 
that, that we can kind of add chiral distance as a measure to existing data on 2D materials. Uh, and that's perhaps a helpful way of going hunting for, for, for materials of interest. Uh, the other thing we want to show is the materials cloud database. How am I doing for time? Um, uh, so I'll, uh, if people, yeah. It's, it should be okay. Yeah, uh, okay. I think five more minutes. Five more minutes. In that case, I'll just, I'll just gently go through this. So the materials cloud 2D database of Campion and Mune um, is interesting because they have in fact simulated these candidate structures as, as being exfoliated. Uh, but only some of the structures they've kind of then relaxed. They've done some additional DFT to simulate how the 2D layers would behave. And this shows that even having selected um, a, a possibly asymmetric layer structure, you have to be quite careful. So here are the unrelaxed structures, that is the structures that haven't been, have this additional DFT. So we're just looking at them as they would look in their parent material, in their bulk material. And once again, you can see that they like to live on the boundaries, uh, or many of them like to live on the boundaries of high symmetry. But again, you can also see that they like to occupy the interior of the space where we see um, asymmetric uh, 2D layers. Um, we, we see possibly high geometries. But what happens when you then do do the DFT? Well, they almost immediately, uh, they almost, apart from kind of, I think there's three or four structures, that vote, but apart from everything else, they just snap straight to a highly symmetric structure. So again, they show this, this, this interesting phenomenon that these 2D layers really don't want to be asymmetric on their own. They might be quite hard to find. Uh, but uh, so that's that's kind of an interesting result that we've made continuously visible through uh, chiral distances. And again, uh, we obviously want to extend this to a space in three dimensions, uh, but we have this this barrier that obtuse places are not quite isometry invariants, but you can get isometry invariants out of them, uh, and you can get that sort of a similar sort of space. It's a six dimensional space, but you have uh, but that's going to take a bit more work and. The definitions of the metrics are going to need to be uh, more careful and more complicated. So in summary, we can map to uh, similar similarity classes of two dimensional lattices to a two dimensional space. This induces a continuous metric between lattices, which we can use to either compare lattices or see how symmetric they are by defining this G chiral distance. We have differences in chemical properties can indeed give rise to detectable differences in, in, in chiral distance distributions. So it's, uh, it's, it's another useful piece of data. And for 2D materials, chiral distances can, as I've said, isolate possible stable asymmetric lattice structures and show changes in symmetry when layers are isolated from bulk material. And again, all of these are computable by my code, uh, which, you are, which you are welcome to download and try. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matt. Mm -hmm. Super. Oh, okay, uh, I'll stop recording. Uh, as as usual.